to my computer. So limit your uh, name calling and cuss words, please, and we'll be good. All right, so the NJR contract, we're gonna talk about that today. There's a couple places you can find it and I'm gonna go ahead and share them with you. Um, one is the EXT Realty Google Drive. I'll just go ahead and copy this, um, this link for you guys and post it in the chat so you all have it. The only thing I don't like about the Google Drive is the forms generally are not fillable. You have to handwrite them or download them or use a software that'll allow you to edit the PDF to fill it. So I use the NJR forms mostly. So let's go back to sharing my screen. Let's share screen. Sorry, I haven't been on Zoom in a month, so I'm a little rusty. Share screen. Can you see my EXP Realty screen on the up front there? Just making sure it's up and we're loaded. Yep, it's up. Okay, great. So I use uh, the zip forms, which is found in uh, NJAR forms. I guess it's form simple, NJ forms online. I'll go that way. Form simplicity. Every agent should have access to the account once they get there, um, once they become an official realtor. So, oops, Colleen's coming back in. I'm gonna go ahead and log into Zip, Zip Forms Plus. And let's see, I'm gonna go ahead and log on under Joe's account because that's where I write all my contracts. And if you don't have an account, you can just come here where it says new user account setup and go ahead and do that. All right, let me go back to my bookmarks because it's not letting me enter this for some reason. Real estate, EXP. NGR forms are here. All right, so on so here's the URL njrealtor.com and then just click online forms. And it takes me back to this login to zip form plus. And here it's got my info saved, so I don't have to guess what it is. So I'm gonna go to this little, uh, this is the dashboard. I'm gonna click on the uh, new. So I'm gonna do a new contract. I'm just gonna do a new purchase offer. I'm gonna call it, um, and we're in September. September 2023, just so I know it's a test contract for myself. We're gonna do residential. If you see here, I, I have templates saved already. I'm not gonna go over that. Uh, I'll show you that at the end, um, but I do have templates set up, which saves you a lot of time. The first time you sit down to write a contract, it'll probably take you two to three hours. Um, so it's really important just to practice this because each time you do it, it's going to reduce your time. And, you know, and hopefully by the time you write eight or 10 contracts, you have it down to about 30 minutes. But that first one is going to be a doozy. So just be prepared for it. And if you can practice writing them, the better off the, the better off you are. So I created a um, a transaction. So I'm going to go ahead and go to the, my forms. I'm going to the upper right corner where it says all forms. <clears throat> and then you can see here I have some highlighted ones because I've used this several times. I guess it just defaults to them for me. So I always choose a transaction sheet, a consumer information statement, uh, the 
contract with the opinion 26 notice attached to it. I also add exclusive buyer agency agreement, but that that's another conversation we can have in a, a later date. And then the wire fraud, which is part of the contract typically. I also add the dual disclosed agency form. So you'll see here there's informed consent to dual agency. There's four types. Make sure you choose the uh, buyer. And so I have the consumer information statement, the sales contract, and the informed consent to dual agency. Those are the forms that you find in, um, in the zip forms files. Other forms you will also probably need are a lead paint disclosure if the home was built before 1978. You also need a property seller disclosure. Um, so if you know your buyer is going to write a contract, make sure you grab those documents from the MLS listing. I'm going to go ahead and just open up the contract first. So certain things, um, it's all fillable, except if you open the contract first, the only things that aren't fillable are the buyer's name and, and the seller's name. So typically what you would do is I'm going to go back. You go to the transaction cover sheet. Any information you put in the tra transaction cover sheet will populate into the form for you automatically. So <clears throat> I'm just going to go ahead and type in buyer one. I'll type in buyer two. I'm going to do an address, one, two, three, main street. If you have a set of buyers and they have um, different addresses because they're they're engaged and getting married and haven't moved into the same house yet, only put in um, only put in one address in here because the system does not recognize two addresses. I can't spell street today. Uh, we'll call it. Asbury Park, New Jersey, 07712. The other thing we're gonna put in here is the, um, the seller's information. Tom Jones. John, that's funny. I never, um, cause we, I started doing like the contracts in zip forms, like within the last six months, I would say. Mm -hmm. And I've never used the transaction cover sheet. Like if I type it on the opinion 26, it will auto populate for the whole contract and the rest of the documents. I didn't even know that. Yeah. So the reason why I use this, um, is what I typically do is I set up a template. So this would be, this would be my template. So I would fill out the buyer's information, the seller's information is never going to be the same typically, but all mm -hmm. this information down here, like my selling broker information and uh, the listing broker information, like if it's a dual agent, I have a template all set up already with that info in there. So I just come right to the transaction cover sheet because everything is already saved um, and then just add the buyer and seller. But you're saying you start right at the opinion 26 and just add the info. Yeah, so basically what I did was I did like a contract and then Michael's information is already in there um, in the broker information and like some like things that we always are like checked off or whatnot. Yep. Um, and then I just copy that form to each transaction. Yep. Yeah, you can you can do you can do it that way, too. And I, that's what I do a lot. I'll just reuse the form because I'm usually <coughs> the same agent. Um, but yeah, I have I have this set up already. So I have um, I have where I represent the buyer only um, template and I have a dual agent template. So that and all I have to do is add in the information. But like you said, everything else, um, once we get to, I'm just gonna add one seller here real quick. Uh, once you get to you know, the contract, once you have the contract done, that first time it's gonna be take you the longest because you've, you haven't filled out all the information. But once you get all the information filled out, all you're really changing is the buyer, the seller, and the uh, listing office, right? <clears throat> so I'm gonna go ahead and hit save real quick. And then I'm gonna go back to my form. So Alexis said you go right to here and you put in the information and it'll populate into the contract as well. 
Yeah, and then the rest of the um, like buyer docs. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. One one thing I I don't like about the transaction cover sheet, you know, because it does ask you for a lot of information and people get distracted by it. So if you do come right into the contract and start filling in things, it, it's probably quicker. So I, I think I'm going to probably start doing that in the future. <clears throat> So let's see how this works. Selling broker is me. Listing broker is Joe Burris. So the number one common mistake I see with um, dual disclose agency contracts is, especially, um, well, with, the, with EXP, it's happening a lot lately because there's a lot of newer agents that don't understand the dual agency. So if you are showing a property and it's an EXP agent, no matter if they're on a team, if, they're, if their address is a corporate office, we are one brokerage statewide. So any contract that you write, has to, you are a dual disclosed agent. You represent both the buyer and the seller, no matter what. Um, so just make sure you guys have that uh, in your mind. And then the seller's info populated here for me. Um, the property address is here, that populated in. So now the seller's address might not be the same as the as the property address. So make sure you go to the tax records and verify that the <clears throat> that the property address and the seller's address are the same. If they are, just go ahead and duplicate it. So we'll just for the case, sake of um, making it easy. We will say it's the same. Block 10, block 12. Some uh, MLSs make it easy for you. They put the lot and block number in the MLS. Others, you have to go dig for it. Um, I find that kind of annoying, but um, Garden State puts it right in there for us. So that's my primary MLS. Mammoth Ocean, I have to go open the tax record to find out what the lot and block is. Um, but they do other things easier. They make it easy to find the real estate license number. So that's the other thing. So you're going to put in, we're going to say the total purchase price is $500,000 just to keep the numbers simple. Um, their initial deposit, my buyers are luckily conventional. They're going to be 10% down conventional. And, you know, the market is not as competitive as it was. So Typically, I want them to put at least ten thousand dollars down their initial deposit. Um, you know, you always ask them how much money do you have liquid for your initial deposit, and in North Jersey, that deposit check is not cashed until we're out of return review. That's the way I write my contracts. That deposits are due five days after the completion of a return review. Alexis, how do you guys do that in South Jersey? Yeah, we usually um, it's usually like five days after. Okay. Mm -hmm. In the old days, you usually you used to have a, have to have a check paid out to an ex escrow account, and it had to be cashed before it or it deposited at least before it was considered a deposit. We don't do it that way anymore, which is nice. Uh, the initial deposit is ten thousand. Additional deposit will be the remainder of the ten percent, which is forty thousand dollars. And then the mortgage amount is going to be four hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Oops, one too many zeros. Oops, still one too many zeros. And that there's no balance of the purchase price. So let's say if you're putting 20% down and the buyer only wanted to put up 10,000 in initial, uh, $40,000 in the additional deposit, they would still have another $50,000 due. So the balance of the purchase price um, would be 50,000 would go there. And then that would, then your mortgage would be four hundred thousand dollars instead of the four fifty. So let's see if I change this to four hundred. It's going to do that math for you automatically, which is kind of nice. But we'll go ahead and change it back to the four fifty. So we have an initial deposit. Um, you guys probably have the title company hold the escrows. I always check other for me because we do it differently. I always have sellers, attorney. Sorry, I was on mute. Yeah, we, I, it's down in, in Atlanta County. It's 
mo- like nine out of 10 times, it's the title company. Okay. So it can be, it can be the buyer's attorney. It can be a title company. It can be seller's attorney, trust account. Um, and then the, I always do, you can actually put a, spe- a, a specific date in here, but I don't like to do that because you write this contract on a Friday, all of a sudden you, the agent tells you on uh, Sunday, oh, we've got multiple offers. We're going to do a best and final due by a certain date. And if your buyer doesn't want to change their offer, you've got to go back in and change all these dates again, which is a pain in the butt. So I always just write five and you can override the system. It likes to put in a date for you. Five, oops, five days after attorney review. Oops, I just do five days after. I'm just gonna do A slash R. Okay. Additional deposit. I will put um I see where it says here if if left blank within 10 calendar days. I don't like to leave anything blank on a contract because it can be filled in by somebody else. So I always like to at least put um uh 10 days after initial deposit. Oops, gotta get rid of this date that showed up. There we go. Trust account, so of the title company, you would list the name of the title company you guys are using foundation. Title, for the most part. Principal amount is, that's your loan amount. So this would be $450,000 is the loan amount from the previous page of the contract. And if you're gonna re, um, once you get this contract template set up, you have to make sure that you change these numbers. A lot of times we overlook it, but um, you gotta make sure you change it. We're gonna be conventional. Term of mortgage. I don't like to put, I always do TBD to be determined because if the buyer decides they wanna do it a 15 year or a 20 year or a 30 year, and you put terms of mortgage 30 years, if the buyer, doesn't want to do a 30, 30 year contract, they're kind of locked in. They'd have to have an addendum drawn up to change that. So the same thing here, payment based on a, a year schedule, I just do one plus years. Written mortgage commitment, I always do 30 days. And you got to override it again. 30 days after acceptance. Alexis, do you do anything differently here? Uh, Yeah, so for the mortgage commitment, we do seven days prior to the closing date. Okay. Usually, sometimes it's different, but like most of the time, that's what we do. What if your closing date is further out than 30 days? Um, then we usually like um, have an agreement with the the lender. Okay. Um, what day that we should expect that by, and then we that would go on the contract. All right. Mm-hmm. And then the balance of so the per- the closing will take place on, and the calendar pops up for you. And this is the only time I use the calendar in this system. Um, so I'm going to say I want to close the end of the. Yeah, I never want to close in the last day of the month. I don't like to close on a Friday because it, it, it everyone wants to close on a Friday. So I always choose a Tuesday or Wednesday to close just so I'm not competing with 5 million other closings and, and the lender is overwhelmed. So I always choose something that's not right at the end of the month, but close to it. And you get paid the next day. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Excuse me. Um, So the MLS sheet is really, um, so make sure that when you write up a contract, if there are things that are specifically included, you look at the MLS sheet and you add add them. So 
for the Garden State MLS, I always put all per MLS number, and I write the number two, 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 three, four, five, six, whatever it is. Washer, dryer, kitchen, refrigerator. And I specify kitchen because they might have a, a, a refrigerator in the basement or the garage that's an old piece of crap and nobody wants it anyway. So you want to make sure that you're getting the refrigerator that's supposed to be included, not the one that they decide to leave because they were pissed at you about what you asked about for the home inspection. So, you know, and if, if you want to even be more specific, you could put brand names, but, you know, always, you know, put the MLS number and then with your offer, make sure that MLS sheet is included with your offer when you submit it. Um, to everyone. Items excluded. So a lot of times shell sellers may exclude a dining room chandelier. Sorry, I, um, I'm sorry to bother you. I always put um, existing, the word existing. Perfect. However, yeah, well, I guess that that's good. I mean, but if you do a final walkthrough and it's broken, uh, you know, they could say, well, you said existing. So, um, yeah. I also have my home inspector um, put in the report, like everything about the appliances. That's why I have a hard time finding good home inspectors because in my mind, I expect all the appliances to get at least checked out. So that, yeah. that way we have some kind of verbal and written following of what's going on. Yeah, and then, you know, in appliances, it says right in the, the sales contract that all, all appliances are in working order. Or actually in the seller's disclosure, one of them or both of them. So, but yep. So just make, yeah, however you want to word it. So it's specific for you. That's great. <clears throat> just don't leave anything too generic. So if there's anything excluded, um, um, I've seen people exclude their range and they'll replace it with something else. You know, if people want to do stuff like that, I really try to get them from the listing agent to get it replaced prior to putting it on the market. Um, you know, a chandelier or something, but in some homes, you know, the, the light fixtures are really awesome for photos. So I had these people who sold a 1920s home and they were going to exclude all these fixtures that were part of the house. I'm like, it's part of the home. You know, that's what people were buying this home for, <clears throat> but they wanted them. It got down to closing and the cost to get them removed was prohibitive so they had to leave them anyway so it was like it was crazy um dates of time and performances so the buyer selects as the closing agent so put whoever your closing agent in here if it's foundation title if it's an attorney um you know list that in here <clears throat> excuse me my uh my my covid's catching up with me again <clears throat> um this is regarding the certificate of occupants and zoning compliance. So I don't like to leave this blank because 1.5% of our purchase price is a lot of money. We always put a dollar amount in here. I, I put 750. What do you guys do for that, Alexis? 500. 500, okay. Mm -hmm. And then seller represents that there has or has not been any municipal assessments. Um, this is happens a lot in cond condos and townhomes. Uh, not so much for single family, but it can. So depend on your municipality if they assess the homeowners for certain improvements. So make sure you find out whether or not this has uh, been done. So we're just going to say has not. And then the, the type of home, I always, if it's a single uh, two or three family, make sure you write that in here. Single family residential dwelling. possession and tenancies. So if there are tenants listed, make sure you get their name, what unit they occupy, what they're paying in rent, find out what they have for security deposit and find out when the lease expires. Those are really important, especially the security deposit because if there's nothing listed in here and it closes and all of a sudden the buyers say, or the tenants say, hey, we have security deposits, I'm moving out. And you're like, there was nothing in the contract. Well, the tenant's gonna be uh, you know, wanting their deposit back and you'll have to pay it. <clears throat> Lead-based paint disclosure, just check whether it's applicable or not applicable. And if there are no tenants in here, 
I, again, I, like I said earlier, I don't, I don't like to leave anything blank. So I'm just going to write <clears throat> NA, not applicable. So home inspections, um, you know, we're, you guys were in a market where sometimes buyers were waiving inspections or they were for informational purposes only. You know, that market's going to shift. You're going to have uh, more and more, uh, you're going to have less and less uh, or more and more contingencies added to your uh, time frame. So just be prepared for that. But um, so I'm just going to use the recommended amount of days, three days, three days. This is new, so any rental dwelling has to have a lead-based paint certification if it was built before 1978. Um, they have to do an initial one, and then I, uh, um, every municipality is different. For example, Asbury Park wants this for all homes, whether it's a rental or a, a resale, so municipalities have the right to change the language to however they want to, so find out what your municipality is doing regarding lead-based paint. Um, inspection. <clears throat> Point of entry system, that's not applicable for me 99% of the time. I never have cesspools. Um, so do you guys come across these issues at all, Alexis? Um, I think we did have a cesspool once in Hamilton, I believe, okay. um, which is in Atlanta County. Mm -hmm. So if you um, check not applicable, I can't even say that word, applicable, there we go. If you check that, um, that means items A and B below are not part of that, so you don't have to do anything. Inspection contingency clause, this is important. Your buyer is going to do structural termite and radon. They have to typically do the uh, wood destroying insect for anything that has a mortgage on it, so um, make sure that your buyer does those inspections. If it's an FHA buyer, per guidelines, they're not allowed to pay for a wood destroying insect. It's supposed to be the seller's responsibility. Um, I've only had it one time in 25 years where it became an issue that the seller had to pay for it. Usually the buyer just pays for it as part of their whole inspection um, cost. So, keep that in mind. Have you had run into that issue, Alexis? <clears throat> no, we the the buyers have always paid for the the termite inspection for yeah. any of our deals. Mm -hmm. Let me just I think it's set. I think if you see here uh, it might be on the um I forget where it is noted, but it just says if it's an FHA deal, the buyer is not, cannot pay for it. So just keep that in the back of your mind that, you know, it could be an issue. Look at the documents that people are signing. <clears throat> yeah, I never knew that. Yeah, it was threw me for a loop first time I saw it. I was like, what? Oh, maybe that's it. I don't know if it's there in there. Yeah, I was the listing agent and somebody brought it up. So these, the calendar days, I always tighten this up. I put 10 days instead of 14. And if the attorneys want to change it, they can. I'll give that seven. But as far as all inspections go, you should really have them done within you know, that first week. So I always make it 10 days. What number do you guys put in those? Uh, just 10 or four, 14 usually if it says the calendar days. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So should you find any... any um, defects the seller has seven business days you have seven days to re, re, uh, provide a report to the seller of things that you want cured and the seller will have seven days to respond back what they plan on curing so that's kind of important to keep in your mind flood zone um, you know we can do a basic flood search but the title company will do a full flood search Qualified inspectors, it's really important that the buyers realize that they're only use, only allowed to use uh, inspectors that are certified with the state of New Jersey. They can't use their uh, father or uncle or cousin who's a contractor as their inspector. Um, and so just so you know that, Megan's Law, we're not allowed to disclose if there's any potential sex offenders next door to someone. 
that's the consumer's job to go find that out, but we can point them to the website, which where they can find that information, which is right here, the uh, njsp.org. Airport safety zones. Do you guys have to deal with this at all down there? No, it's funny. Michael always uses the example. He lives like three minutes from my airport and he's not even an airport safety zone. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I think I've had to use this once. <clears throat> Book sales, this is if an investor has uh, has purchased multiple properties, maybe under a 203K or has multiple properties in their portfolio under the same LLC, they, they, they would res be responsible for letting, you know, doing the proper paperwork. This is kind of what title companies and the, the attorneys deal with. Make sure your buyer is aware that homeowners insurance, uh, one pre one year prepaid homeowners insurance policy is due. The mortgage lender will remind them 10 times, but it's prepaid. Then every month, once they close, they're going to be escrowed a dollar amount to cover the, 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 the next year's insurance policy. Maintain the condition of the property. So the day the buyer writes the offer and, and the home ho hopefully is well maintained, that's the same way they expect to find it when they do their final walkthrough. The seller must carry homeowner's insurance until the day of closing. Initial and final walkthroughs. Are you guys doing this down there, Alexis, or are you just doing one walkthrough? Um, they, we usually have a final walkthrough either the day before or the day of closing. So this, that's how it was done forever. But about five years ago, they started a thing where you had to do an initial walkthrough after the home inspection was done and, and repairs were completed. Because if the pair, repairs weren't completed to the buyer's satisfaction, you could not get a credit back at closing for those repairs. So they used to make us do an initial, which we're supposed to do still, but we never do. Um, initial walkthrough to verify those repairs are done. And the final walkthrough is just to walk through to make sure that you know no one broke into the property and that all your appliances are still in working order. So that's what that was for and we're supposed to do. Um, adjustments at closing is really important. Um, you know, the, the seller will pay taxes for the quarter. They'll be reimbursed the portion of that quarter um, that they lived in the property or that, that they don't live in the property, I'm sorry. Um, they'll also pay for, you know, water. So make sure that you, if you're the listing agent, make sure you tell your sellers to, you know, let the utility companies know that they, um, are gonna discontinue service and there's gonna be a buyer taking over their service. So this is, um, this is the only thing I don't like. So if you put, Alexis, when you put the um, agent's information in the opinion 26, do they populate here or no? Uh, no, I don't believe so. Yeah, that's the one thing I don't like about that. Okay. So we're going to talk about a dual disclosed agent because this is kind of confusing. So we're going to do EXP Realty. This is the listing and selling office. <clears throat> and we're going to say Joseph Burris is a listing agent. And then I'm the selling agent. So you would put a comma here, John Nash. And we are dual disclosed agents. You would leave uh, line 572 letter B blank because there's no option down here to check dual disclosed agents. So you would write agent one is a listing agent, agent two is the buyer's agent. You check dual disclosed agent and then you go ahead and down here, put the listing firm, which would be EXP Realty. The uh, license rec ID, I can't believe I don't know what it is. There it is. And then the listing agent, Joseph Burris. So a lot of times, especially with the Garden State MLS, I see agents put the MLS number as the real estate uh, license ID. That's not correct. It's gotta be the license number and you have to look that up. Some MLSs provide it for you. Others don't. So how about for Bright? What do they do? 
on the rec ID. Um, they usually have bright, like they'll have in parentheses, but honestly, I never go by that just to like make sure I always go on like the state's website and make sure everything's correct. Yep. So I'll go ahead and share that link with you guys. So we all have that. Um, onboarding. So you would just go up here and type in the agent's uh, name. You can just do last name, first initial. We'll try that. So, and then hit search. So we got Joseph Burris, actively licensed. So employee reference number, that's the company. Reference number is the agent's ID number. So that's where you would find those. I'm just gonna go ahead and copy it. Now, have you guys ever come across like when you're looking up someone's license number and it says they're inactive and they're trying to do a deal? Like, have you ever had that happen before? No. No, I have not. And it's it's funny because um, wives, well, I've seen it when I'm not at one of my deals, but I was look, I was another EXP agent called me like, oh my god, my thing, my license is inactive, so I went in here and looked. I'm like, oh my god, it is. So, <laughs> yeah, you can't write enough. You can't write. They they can't be negotiating a deal if their license is inactive. So you'd have to do it under their brokerage, I guess, if that's where they're, if, if, if that's, or find out, yeah, it's weird, but yeah, they can't be doing that. Um, where is my, did I lose my NJAR forms? Hope not. Let me go back, go back, go back. Oh, I did, I lost it. So we'll go back to this one. Hopefully it's saved it, but if not, no biggie. Yeah, it's the one thing I don't like about zip forms. I don't think it auto saves. You have to manually click save. Yep. So get in the habit of doing that because God, look, look it didn't save. Let's see if it saved anything I filled in. Nope. So anyway, we're good on that. We went through it all. So I, I just filled out this. We got the rec ID, the office address you can get from that. Um, let me go there again. And I'm going to open a new tab. And post that exp. No, that was onboarding license. I'm going to post this link so you guys all have it. Uh, where's my Zoom chat? Hmm. Uh oh. <clears throat> oh, there we go, chat. This is where you can look up agents' license information. Go back to this. So, um, Joe, I have all Joe's information here as a listing agent already because this is one of my templates. Commission do participating firms, so that would be you. So whatever the MLS is offering, um, make sure you put that in there. I know you guys, uh, in, in most of our area, people do the 2 or 3%, um, whatever it is, minus the ML fee. Um, and unfortunately, I'm seeing some of these ML fees getting really, really big. Remax is really known for high MLS fees. Um, so you would put that in there. So we'll just do 3%. I'll do minus. Some seven. contacts. Um, sorry to interrupt again. This is terrible right. about me this morning, John. <laughs> yeah, no, um, I, like, I want your input, so no problem. Thank you. So some contracts already say per MLS. Um, for the uh, sell side, um, listing side commission, and I recently had a, one of my agents that I know ask me if that was, you know, normal, and I said, yeah, absolutely, because we aren't going to dictate as buyer's agent what the listing agent's commission is. It's not our place to do that. They already negotiated that with their client. Yeah. The only time I, um, the only time I put in 
the commission do participating firms if we're a dual agent on that? Like, I, like, and it's um my it's my team. Then I put in the total commission. If it's oh, not, yeah. if it's not, um, like when when I get the contract, if I'm if I'm the listing agent, I will add my commission into that before I have my seller sign it. Mm -hmm. So that way it's in there. <clears throat> Hey, John, I have a question. I'm still in traffic. Um, oh, yeah. Do you, do you um, if, if it does say 2% or 1% for the buyer's um, commission and, and you are the buyer's agent, um, have you ever in, in your time or as the selling agent, um, have you ever had anybody try to um, negotiate uh, commissions? No, because if you wanted if you wanted more money, it would be your buyer's obligation to pay it. They offered that in the MLS as the percentage. Gotcha. I just wanted that answer because I get asked that a lot privately. Yeah. Um, from our group. Uh, they fight the so, I, Michael, you were breaking up. I don't know. Can you hear me? hear you just fine i'm sorry i was just saying there's some agents that um that just put three percent in the contract and then if the listing agent doesn't catch it when it's all signed um they fight about it on the at the closing table so i was just uh aware and i just didn't know if you had any experience with that that's all i'm sorry yeah no i've never i've never um had that uh, happen so you know I, but i haven't dealt with i the only time i've ever sold anything less than two percent was there for sale by owner um, and I don't, I barely, I don't even think I've maybe done most of my stuff I sell is two and a half to 3% on the buy side, but yeah, I can, you can, you know, in a buyer agency agreement that's in this, um, zip forms, it says that the buyer will basically make up the difference. So, I mean, you could put it back on your buyer if you wanted to, I, I would never do that because I'm, you know, part of our job as realtors is to help a buyer find a home. Um, so yeah, it, it's hard. I know that. I know that no one wants to receive less than two and a half percent or even three, but you know, it's, that's why homes that are only offering one or 2% don't get shown as much because no agent wants to be compensated, you know, $4,000 and the company takes 60% of it or 40% of it. And you're like, then you got to pay taxes. What are you left with? You know? So it's crazy. Anybody else have anything? Yeah, just real quick, I wanted to mention that, um, or ask you, not really ask you because I know the reason, but I have encountered uh, where agents are not presenting all offers, and that's still the law, correct? If I haven't missed anything about, we are no longer required to submit our written offers to our sellers, that's incorrect, right? Totally incorrect. Yeah, okay, I just wanted to double check because I recently ran into that and I thought that was quite strange, being that I thought that was number one rule in real estate. Yeah, I mean, if you suspected that somebody didn't submit your offer, I would make a copy of that offer and drop it in their mailbox, you know? It's like, yeah, you know. I thought that was legal to do too, but I just didn't really want to um, overstep. And, you know, I just thought in this case it was null. You know, sometimes it just winds up to be null. So I just, you know, rather not ruffle feathers. And <laughs> it depends. Like if I'm fighting for my client, I have to, but I would reach out to one of y'all first because I still don't want to ruff, ruffle feathers. I don't know what it is. It's people pleasing. I need to get rid of it. Well, no, I mean, we are in a people pleasing business, but yeah, no, I, I there's, I always wonder if I'm in a multiple bid, if my offer is being really present been presented and you know there are forms that you could submit that says you know uh, please have seller sign uh, confirmation that they received the written offer um, most agents will throw them in the garbage because there's no law that says they have to have that document signed but um, you know if, if I really suspected somebody of foul play I would maybe send a letter to the seller if it's an occupied home and they live there it's great and say hey my client submitted an offer we just want to make sure that you got it um, you know and there's nothing wrong with that. 
Right. There's also another way to track your offers and all your paperwork. I don't know if anybody's listening, but if you use DocuSign, I'm sure that you can attach your documents and send those to the agents because that's what I usually do. So that that way, as soon as an agent touches that email, I get a notification. So I know if they opened it or not. Yeah, I do the same thing with um, Skyslope. When I, when I send my contract out for signature, so I make sure that the attorney receives a copy, the title company receives a copy, um, and then the listing agent will get a copy as soon as it's signed by everybody. So that way I know, but for an initial offer, same thing. I, I, because I'm on the road half the time, I don't want to wait. I don't want to miss the buyer's email coming back to me to download it, to resend it. So yeah, I just set it up so that the listing agent will receive a copy of the offer once it's executed. Yeah. And then you can see in Skyslope, it tracks it all for you. Oh, that's super cool. I forgot that you did that, John. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to have to try to give that a whirl. Yeah. Skyslope, I mean, you're, it's, it's nice. It's, you know, you can store a lot of information in there. I don't know if DocuSign, like you, you can upload photos if you wanted to, uh, if, like if it's your, if it's listing. So you can store a lot of information in Skyslope. So, you know, I would try to get in the habit of using it if you can. We'll, we'll go over that next week. Um, but you can set up templates for signatures. So it's uh, much faster and there's all kinds of things you can do. <clears throat> um, so let's see. Closing disclosure. So, where was I here? So, if your um, if your buyer or seller is a licensed real estate agent, you have to check applicable or not applicable. I believe that if it's inactive but it's still held with the state, they are still considered licensed. So, you would check applicable, and then I would just maybe check um, that they're a referral agent at this point because they can't sell. Hey, John, I have another question. I'm sorry. Um, have you dealt with anything? There's a new thing for uh, Keller Williams, and um, I'm seeing it a lot in Bright MLS, and I know you really don't usually work that uh, MLS, but I didn't know if your team did. Um, I know uh, some of our group uses it, and I know we use it a lot, Alexis and I, but we're seeing um, in the MLS that it says offers are to be sent to, you know, HTTPS uh, slash you know, Michael Kravchak slash um, KW something, and all offers must come here. We're not taking any written offers. And then, so when I click that link that they have the offers go to, it asks for my client's email, phone number, first name, address. And I don't know if, if they just won't accept my offer if I just send a regular one. This new uh, Keller Williams uh, um, program wants all of our clients stuff, um, information. So I don't know if we're allowed to just go around that or if that's something new that Keller Williams is like, well, now we can reach oh, out to yeah. these people in a year and say, are you still happy with this? So that's why I, I didn't know if you have seen that. I'll actually find one of the listings. Yeah. Um, all of all of like Keller Williams, uh, Cherry Hill, Keller Williams, Williams, Morristown, and Keller Williams, Marlton are all using the same thing. And it and you literally go to their listing in 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 the agent notes. It says, uh, you know, copy and click this link. We will not accept any offers off of this. We, you must go to this one. So. Doesn't it seem like illegal or something that they're getting all of our clients' stuff? Yeah, it, it does. It does, and I, I would probably, um, I would probably just make up a name, <laughs> and you know, and, and yeah, have, for sure, John Smith. I'm yeah, so down. Amy Weiner, have, whatever you got to use, man. And have and have another email address like I have AP or Bust at Yahoo.com. I would use that. I would use my Google Voice phone number and just use that every time for the for your clients that you send offers to, you know, to them because they they don't have any right to your clients' information. Yeah, use the office ring number with your extension or do five 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 one two one two. Yeah, I yeah, just didn't I, know, and I I, I, I I did see it. I would probably leave, do my Google Voice number because then you would actually be able to say, hey. You're you're soliciting my client, and I signed a you know a buyer agency agreement agreement with them, and we're going to sue you, you know, type of thing. So, yeah, I would probably use a phone number that you can actually capture them trying to do that. But yeah, I would um, I would 
maybe share that with uh, our broker team at EXP and see what their thoughts are on it. I'm sure, you know, they have a legal team and they could say, shut that shit down, you know? Yeah, it's a great idea. I'm, I just sent a text to Alexis and said, I'll, I'll send you one of those because I, I did show a property um, this past weekend um, to a client of mine and, and we always go to Cherry Hill and, um, and just the Keller Williams uh, folks, it always says it in there. Um, you know, it's their link. It's, some, I, it's something new that just started over the last two months and literally everybody at Keller Williams has it. And if you go through it, like I started to, you know, just go through, I didn't even want to make the offer, but I wanted to see what it was. It has like their fee on there. It has their commission. Like it, it literally has everything, but it asks for every single bit of information. I almost felt like we were plugging it into Zillow and they were getting our, our clients information. Yeah. That's what it sounds like. And yeah, once that, yeah, th that needs to be shut down somehow. So I would definitely, you know, share that with the state broker, or, you know, I don't know if you have an attorney that you work with and say, Hey, can they do this? You know, type of thing. Thank you for sharing that too. Yeah, that's, because that's crazy. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Okay. Uh, so if there's any addendums in this program, if you check the addendum, uh, like FHA loans, other documents will populate for you to include it with your offer. So anything that you check in here will also be added. So if it's a condo, FHA, um, <clears throat> lead paint disclosure, which you know you don't want to use a lead paint disclosure that's not pre-initialed and signed by the seller. So you want to make sure that the seller always signs first. And then in here, if you have additional contractual revisions, something that you guys, a lot of you might not have seen or newer agents might not have seen are seller concessions so now you're going to probably start seeing seller concessions as listings start sitting on the market longer you know if something's on the market for uh, longer than 30 days and your buyer needs a little help with closing costs um, those are properties i would start looking at so i would just say for example this is how we word it in our contracts you guys might do it differently seller to pay ten thousand dollars towards Files, prepaids, escrows, and points. Well, that's how I would have asked for closing costs um, for my my my, uh, my buyer. How do you guys do that, Alexis or Colleen? I do. Um, sorry to interrupt anybody. I do the um, buyer and seller agree to use whatever X amount of dollars toward closing costs and prepaids. Okay. And then for the math, I was gonna ask you, John, if you could real quick do a fake math thing down there um, yeah. so that you know everybody can see that. Yeah. So I'm gonna go to the very beginning of the contract, which I think is probably empty now. So if you're writing a contract for $500,000, and this initial deposit will keep all these numbers the same. And well, yeah, you can have you can have a seller concession on a FHA and conventional. So we'll leave it we'll leave it conventional just for um, the heck of it. And then additional deposit would be forty. So oops. And the mortgage amount would be 450. All right. So this is our typical sales contract where we have um, purchase price of $500,000 with 10% conventional, but the buyer wants $10,000 back for closing costs. So in the seller, in, in the listing agent's mind, the seller might not grasp this right away. The offer is really only uh, 490 because the seller is getting $10,000 back for closing costs. So I'm just going to go to the last page here and go over the numbers here so you can see that next to the. All right, so we have a $500,000 offer. And I wouldn't write this in the contract here, but just so you guys can see it, how it works. $500,000 offer. with a $10,000 con concession. 
So this concession, the, buy, the buyer is actually financing that concession over the life of their loan, just so you guys understand that. So it's really not a, a seller give back, but the seller does receive less in, in their contract price. So the seller is going to actually receive $490 because they're getting a $10,000 concession. Oops. Let's go to the next page. So whatever the seller concession amount is, it can be 8,000, it can be 12,000. It can only be up to, uh, is it 3% of the purchase price? Does anybody have that number in their head? I think it's 3%, I haven't done one in so long. Yeah, it's three to four, depending. Okay. That's what the lender always recommends, approximately three and a half. All right, and let's say your closing costs are, let's say the lender says ask for $15,000 in closing costs. Well, if they ask for that much in closing costs, that's a lot of money and their closing costs probably are not gonna be that much. And the buyer does not get that money back. So I'm always very careful about uh, leaving a blank a percentage in there or a dollar amount. Uh, typically eight to $10,000 on a $500,000 house will cover most of their closing costs. So mm -hmm. make sure that you guys don't put a huge number in there um, unless the lender can show you why it needs to be that amount. Right, uh, and then also in the end game at closing, the lender, well, a few days before they've got to do it, they can recede out the, um, they don't always do for the appraisal because the buyer pays the appraisal and then the lender puts it back on, and, you know, the closing sheet, but sometimes it doesn't, it's a pain in the butt. Sometimes the buyer doesn't get the receipt to the lender and they don't really get the money back. Exactly. Exactly. So does, do you guys understand that or do we need to explain that again in a different way? I think um, we have Depali and Ariel. Ariel, do you, do you understand that? No, I completely understand. I'm just, I'm just, yeah. No worries. Okay. Yeah, you got it. All right. Awesome. It's, I think it's 6%. Uh, um, depends on the loan, but it, the concession, I think, is around 6%. Because I had a contract, it's 146. Um, but condo, we just got under contract and they asked for $8,000 mm. um, um, concession. And I think before that, we received the same similar thing i think john confirmed it. it's i think it's up to six six percent of the uh, um the price well the seller gets whatever's left back so if the buyers don't use it the seller takes it all yeah mm -hmm. yeah so just be careful with putting a percentage in there the um mm -hmm. the other thing i was going to mention and let me think what was that so um yeah, I, yeah, that's it. So can, can seller can, uh, oh, if, if a buyer, if you have a buyer that's an FHA and only has three and a half percent down, they can almost buy a home with, with no money if you're asking for a seller concession. So, you know, if you're talking to people that are like, oh, I don't have that money to put down, try to get them FHA approved with um, a seller concession, you know, because I think in the next six to 12 months, we're going to see, you know, more and more homes on the market longer and you know sellers will entertain a seller concession um especially it, you know if it's not going to really change their net so for me if i was writing up a, a contract on a five hundred thousand dollar house and the buyer wanted seller concession i would make my offer at 510 so the seller's getting the list price to 500 because i want them to feel like they're not losing anything you know because you you know they don't have to accept a concession so if you offer them more than their list price if it's worth it if it's not worth it then then you know of course offer offer less but you know if you feel that the market's still hot and you don't want your buyer to lose out and the seller's willing to accept a concession you know make the concession on top of the the list price just a if, quick question on concession yeah. um so I, I'm pretty sure that's what I'm thinking it's right, but I just want to confirm. So whenever the concession is in the our offer, 
uh, seller is um, not paying taxes on the price of the concession. They are, they are debited first and then after whatever they are taking, get tax, they get New Jersey state tax on that, correct? No, they pay tax on the, they're, they're paying tax on their total gain. So if the seller's netting for 90, um, they're paying and, that, and that's all gain, they would pay tax on their, well, minus, minus, and minus their um, $250,000 allotment. And if there's two of them, there's no gain. So it all depends on how much the gain is. Mm -hmm. But Okay, so whatever they're taking home, they're paying uh, taxes on the take-home uh, money, not the, the actually price of the, with the concession. Right, because the seller is going to have, if, they're, if the seller documents all their improvements over the life of the home, which, you know, I've never, I, I don't see a lot of sellers do that. You can, there's a lot of deductions. If there's going to be a gain, you can deduct from improving the home over a period of time. So there's a lot of ways around it. And, you know, that I, I wouldn't get too involved in numbers without talking to have them talk to an accountant. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Because I get the question and, and I um, I get the question, like, I'm not paying taxes on the concession price, right? You know, the paying taxes on whatever you're taking home after even you pay the mortgage, the leftover mortgage. I don't, I think, I think the seller is, um, it's, there's still a gain. So I think the seller would have to pay a, a tax on that. I haven't seen a a um, seller concession in so long that I forget what it looks like on a HUD. Okay. I'll find out for you though. Okay. Anybody else have a comment on that or an answer? And I always mention that with the commission, commission, you know, there should be after concession amount. So is um, not, it's net to seller is what I put on the contract. I put commissions are paid net to sell after net to seller. Yes. Um, yeah. seller, yeah. 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 I have a question. Well, not a question. I just wanted to make sure um, with the home inspections, um, it is the, we are encouraged to, or we most likely should explain to our sellers, when we are presented with structural, environmental, or safety concerns on a home inspection, I mean, some sellers just want to disregard that. I actually was an agent for uh, this person in Atlantic City who was very, like, not, not right, and he just didn't really much care about things. So luckily, we found a buyer that didn't care either, but um in that case i almost had to walk away from that listing because mm -hmm. he was so like not not okay in the head you know what i mean about that mm -hmm. um and it got to be to the point where finally i wound up having to make him do some of the work anyway i was like if you want to sell it you have to do this work or you have to lower the price like it's one or the other what do you think about that john do you have any comments um, you know, I always tell my sellers that, you know, these issues that are coming up now will come up for the next buyer and they might come up with more. I said, you know, you've got this on the table, you know, what you're dealing with, um, you know, they need to be done or disclosed either way, you know. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, I get it, you know, and especially, you know, <clears throat> In this last market, I mean, sellers didn't have to do jack jack crap, you know, and and now, you know, as this market changes, they're going to have to start doing stuff and it's going to it's going to be harder. I mean, right now, you guys, people are taking out buyers and we're showing them five million houses and writing five million contracts and not getting them accepted. But, you know, five years ago, you were showing a buyer 10 homes a day every weekend for six months before they would write a contract. So it's almost the same thing, um, but it wasn't as competitive, which, you know, I kind of like because if you're, a, if you're a, a good real estate agent and you can, can feel what your client needs, 
um, you know, that really helps to make, help them make a decision. I don't like my clients ask me all the time, well, what do you, what do you think? I said, well, I'm not really buying this property. So it's, you know, does this meet your needs? So I always kind of flip the switch, but I don't know, um, Ariel, I don't think you've taken out any clients, but are you guys having clients in your car or are they following you when you go to listings or how are you guys doing it nowadays? Following us. Following? I think that's the safe way to do because of the, something happened that it's your, your liability, correct? That's what I learned in school. <laughs> man, yeah, me too, man. I agree. Together. So I, I agree, pre-pandemic, I always traveled with my buyers. Um, if they had a child, I jumped in the car with them. I never put a child in my car, um, but it was, I would jump in the car with them. And the reason why that is, is because this is a people business. You wanna build relationships. If they're sitting in another car, it's really hard to develop that relationship with people. And I get why, and I'll probably never have a buyer in my car again, unless I know them personally, but, um, yeah, I totally agree that you shouldn't have them in your car, but you've got to define, you have to find another way to develop that relationship. So make sure that when you're at these listings, you're spending more time with them, finding more information about your clients, you know, write down their kids' names, their pets' names, if they mention them. And so when you have conversations, you're developing that bond and that relationship because it's so easy in this information society of texting. I mean, we don't call people anymore that you don't have a, a, a bond. So really work on building bonds with people because as this market slows down, you're going to have longer relationships with them. <clears throat> yep. So for, so that, another thing that you guys want to get in the habit of um, doing with your offers is uh, EXP has in the Google Drive this warranty, if I can find it here. This APHW waiver. Can you see this form? Can you guys see this on the screen? Yeah. So even if your buyers um, don't want to purchase this, just have them sign this waiver. So in every contract, I just have them sign this automatically. And if at a later date, they decide they want to buy it or the seller says, I'll give you a home warranty to cover, you know, all these inspection issues, then you can just tear this one up and submit another one. But if you get this document signed by your client um, and a, a action comes up against you, against your error and emissions insurance, a, APHW will cover your $1,500 deductible. So try to get this signed by every client um, when you do an offer. Hmm. Even that, the other, as the Google Doc? That's That was in Google Docs, yeah. It's titled uh, APHW Waiver. Okay. If you guys are writing contracts on vacant land, there's a form here for that. Uh, here's the buyer agency agreements that you can use. I try to use them with every single buyer that I meet. And then if you have a for sale by owner, here's a commission agreement you can have them sign. Mm -hmm. Here's, we talked about uh, owner's confirmation of receipt of written offer. That's here. Proposal to purchase. If you have anything that is a um, multifamily, I'm um, sorry, five family uh, or five family or a commercial property, you would use this. And then you, I, you guys probably use this release of sales contract um, I've never used that because I have attorneys kill my deals for me, but here's that form. So as you can see, uh, this drive has got a lot of great documents uh, for us to use. Escalation clause. Buyer inspection waiver. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff in here.
Anybody else have any questions? Not I, I. Thank you. For I don't have a call. question, but um, I just want to make a point because I've been seeing this more and more recently. When like where the um have the sellers and we receive offers, a lot of other um brokerages they don't have the wire fraud addendum included in the contract. And then if you don't like catch that and you upload it to SkySlope, um, the transaction team will kick it back and say, "Hey, we need the wire fraud addendum signed." And then it's kind of a pain, like going back and forth with the agent because they're like we don't need to sign this blah 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 but just make sure like when you're doing all the signatures and everything at time of signing that that is included in the contract because it is required yeah the other thing too is when you're doing a listing there you can have that form signed by your seller so it'll be there for you at least and that's all you'll need for the sky slope transaction but it is here at the end of every contract so if you're using this to write your contracts you'll see it which is great but yeah, if you do, when you do get a listing, just make sure you have your sellers um, sign the wire fraud form. So you have one for your file and then you're covered and you don't have to do it, Alexis said. The yeah, other thing and then another point I've seen like something recently, which is this the first time like I've ever had this being kicked back on Skyslope. Um, so if we have a, a listing, um, a house is built like 1960, um, we always put the lead-based paint addendum signed by the sellers in the MLS as a document, but a lot of times the agents, the buyer's agents aren't looking at the documents in the MLS, so they're not using them, um, and they just sign like their own lead-based uh, lead paint addendum, and we just had the seller sign that signed one, and we uploaded that in Skyslope um, in the buyer docs, and that was also kickback. They said the buyers have to sign the original seller signed lead-based paint from the day of the the listing was signed. Yeah, it took, it's uh, in the in that EPA document. The let's because it is an EPA document. I'm going to just go over that document. Let me pull it up here. Um, it does have to be um, signed by the seller. We used to have to do wet signatures, and it used to have to be the seller had to sign it and date it, and then the listing agent had to sign and date it, and those dates had to match. They couldn't be different. So that was the issue. And then the buyer has to sign it and their date has to be that date or later. It can't be earlier than the seller. So yeah, it should be the seller must sign that document first before the buyer signs it. Because yeah, it's the dates were even after, but they still wanted the original lead-based paint that was from the like original listing documents that were uploaded. Okay. Yeah, they must be getting picky about that kind of they're, stuff. Yeah, they're definitely getting stricter with some stuff. So just... Um, be careful, everyone. <laughs> I have a friend who's an agent in um, in in uh, Connecticut, and the amount of documents that they need for their file, I'm like, oh my god, I could never do it. <laughs> Pennsylvania is crazy. <clears throat> Let's see here if I can get this lead paint. There it is. So. A, B, and C must be initialed by the sellers, and they have to check one of these, uh, one of these items. Either no, no knowledge of lead-based paint, or seller has no knowledge of lead-based paint. So, if they have knowledge, they have to attach any reports. So, all three of these have to be signed, and then the seller has to sign it and date it, and the listing agent has to sign it and date it, and then that should be uploaded in the MLS if it's a good real estate agent. Um, Otherwise, now once the, when you get this for your buyer to sign it, purchaser has received uh, copies of all information above in section three. So let's go up and look at section three. So they would initial that. Purchaser has received a pamphlet, protect your family from lead in the home. I don't know how many of you guys are sending these to your client, but you should attach this with your offer and with the lead-based paint addendum they have to sign. And that document is here as well. It says, uh, where is it? <clears throat> Protect your family. Here's the whole booklet. And I always just have my buyer's initial the last page of it. And then I, I put the lead-based paint disclosure form right after it. And make sure they initial A, B, and C. Um, I always just check the box, receive the 10-day opportunity to do the test. Um, so that way they have it. 
A technically doesn't have to be initialed unless because if there's no, nothing to disclose, they haven't received any copies of any information. So, but if, if there was a, a lead-based paint test attached to this report, then you wouldn't have them initial this. But if you have it initialed, I don't think um, our transaction team would kick it back to us because it's initial. But if, it, if there's documents, it definitely has to be initialed. So make sure they initial A, B, and C and check a box. I always see a box not checked here. So make sure it's checked and then you sign, the purchaser signs it and then the buyer's agent would sign it and date it. Again, make sure, and your date cannot be before the purchaser's date. It's gotta be the same date or later as the purchaser. <clears throat> Let's see, I think that's all the forms. All right, anybody else have any other questions? I had a quick question. Uh-huh. So I was talking to another realtor and they just gave me a tip about like people wanting to buy or sell like in, a, in, a, in an area other than the MLS that you have. And yeah. they were trying to give me this tip that you could basically get around buying or you know, signing up for a whole new MLS via uh, the, uh, what was it? Showing time. Oh, Ariel, your speaker went off. Can you hear me now? Yep. Oh, yeah, is that valid? You can, yeah, so I'm not a member of every MLS either. Um, so you can go into showing time and if you type in the property address, Showing time will populate the showing instructions for you. Um, the downside of that is if you if it's a super and you don't have access to that MLS, you won't be able to open the lockbox. But if they have a combo lockbox or the seller is going to let you in or the listing agent's going to accompany you, then yeah, you can use showing time to gain access to those listings. Okay. Yep. So that's that's a great way. Like sometimes um, a, a consumer will give me a property address and it's not in my MLS. You can also go into Zillow and find it, or you just type the address in Google and it'll pull it up for you and you can get the information. But yeah, showing time is super easy um, to do that. And you can also, I think everybody on this call has probably seen it. You can, with showing time, you can, they have a smart route feature where you can just put all the properties you want to show into a cart and then you, um, click on smart route at the bottom and it'll put the properties in the best order for you to show them. And then you can make your appointments after they're set up in the correct order. I never use that, but that's a good idea. It's all, it saves you so much time. Oh my God. Yeah. <clears throat> so I want, by direction then I guess. Yeah. Yeah. It, mm -hmm. it pulls them all up uh, and shows you how much time between each listing. It's perfect. So I wanted to show you guys. So once you, once you've created your contract, you can reuse that contract over and over. So here's one that is all filled out already. I represent, um, uh, I represented the buyer on this one, but so all I would go back in here is and change if I was writing this contract again, is the buyer's information, the seller's information. Um, all that information would change in the contract, but all, and I would change the mortgage amount and stuff like that, but all these other areas that you have filled in, you don't have to fill them in again. They're all done for you. So you can, I would recommend, you know, using the same contract over and over, set up one for a dual agent. So you don't have to type in all that company information twice, and then set up one where you represent the buyer only. And then you'll just have to change the listing agents information and then the buyers and the sellers information every time you write a contract. So try to, you know, try to get in the habit of reusing contracts. So uh, it'll, <clears throat> help speed up your whole contract writing process. Anybody have any questions? All right, I'm gonna go ahead and stop recording. I have to, I guess I have to stop share. There we go. All right, so next week I'm gonna um, go over Sky Slope and DigiSign so you guys see how that works um, and it can help you speed up your whole process. It's really great because you can 
let's if you get forms uh, yeah it's so fast to use it you got you guys have to use it anyway for your completed files so it would be nice for you to get in the habit of using it for everything else because it's a one stop shop for you then <clears throat> All right, well, if you guys need anything, feel free to text me. I hope you have a great uh, rest of the week and peace out till next week. Thank you so much, John. Thank you, John. Thank you.